you are listening to Kubernetes Byte, a podcast bringing you the latest from the world of cloud-native data management. My name is Ryan Walner, and I'm joined by Bob and Shaw, coming to you from Boston, Massachusetts. We'll be sharing our thoughts on recent cloud-native news and talking to industry experts about their experiences and challenges managing the wealth of data in today's cloud-native ecosystem. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. We're coming to you from Boston, Massachusetts. Today is January 27th, 2023. Hope everyone is doing well and staying safe. Bavin, let's dive into it. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Uh, it snowed a couple of times since we last spoke. So I had Finally. To shove. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but I had to shovel. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know. That It wasn't as bad, like it wasn't a big storm, so it at least in Arlington. This where is I like am. the most mild Boston yeah. winter I've ever been. Oh yeah, of. for sure. <laughs> I, I couldn't be happier, you know. <laughs> like I was contemplating in November uh, or October, should I buy a snowblower or should I not? Yeah, and then good I was thing like, you did. Yeah. <laughs> like that would have been just sitting in the garage. You know what? Now it'll like dump two feet of snow several times in March or something <laughs> weird for you. Don't worry. Okay. Mother Pretty Nature has it, has her ways to get back at us Bostonian New England New Englanders. So mm-hmm. yeah. Anyway, what else have you been up to? No, I'm just excited with the football season. Like, I know we're coming to an end. Last week was divisionals. This week is conference championships. Those games have been awesome. That's, yeah, that's I my forgot, weekend. I forgot always. to watch any of it. So, <laughs> it started already? <laughs> <laughs> no, you should, like, really watch the games this weekend. Like, the, some, some good games this weekend. So, But yeah, enough about me. Talk about your noodle tour. Like, what was going on there? Noodle tour. Yes. Well, um, as you know, a few weeks ago, I won't say which day, but I celebrated a birthday. I'm, you know, one year older. Yeah. <laughs> Very <day> specific. Older. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I, you know, like like we do on our conferences, you, Tim, and I, and, uh, mm-hmm. and whoever we can drag along, yep. <laughs> go to uh, a, a good noodle spot um, in whatever city the conference is in. It's always a lot of fun. If you don't yep. do that, I recommend it, especially if you like noodles. Go right. check it out. Ask us for a list if you'd like some. We'll give you our list. Um, but <laughs> for my birthday, I, t- I picked a few spots um, in Worcester, mm-hmm. uh, Massachusetts, that I have not been to and they've been on my list. One was a really good uh, Vietnam- Vietnamese place called Saigon House. Mm-hmm. Uh, and another one was uh, Char Su. Okay. Or Japanese. And... Uh, yeah, just went to, I mean, I, I envisioned that I could eat more than just two places, but <laughs> after I got done with the second place, I was like, nope, nope, definitely couldn't have done more than two places. And I ate modestly at both because I wanted to be able to eat both. Um, although the, the sake at the second place was very good. You got to pick your own uh, cup and everything. It was um, it was delicious. Nice. So, that, that sounds like a birthday well spent. Okay, yeah, yeah, one of the yeah. one of the better ones. I can't complain. Yeah. <laughs> 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 anyway so um have any fun plans or we want to dive into the news yeah let's do news uh yeah. my plans for the weekend is just watching nfl football so yeah. <laughs> yeah, i'd say that's pretty good and yeah. cool well why don't you start us off Bobin? yeah so uh, a few things right uh, we have a couple of articles that i wanted to talk about and three different acquisition news so let's start with the articles right uh yeah. one of the things that came across was WeWorks donated their third project to CNCF now. The project is called Cured uh, with a K. Uh, and this is the third after they donated Cortex and Flux already. Yeah. Uh, Cured was originally, I think, started in, back in 2017. But like, it's not a fancy tool, but it's more of like a reboot daemon, right? That, that performs safe automatic node reboot. So what it does is it continuously checks for uh, the reboot sentinel file in slash where run reboot required and if that exists it works with the api server locks it in so that only one node of your cluster reboots at a time it also cordons and drains worker nodes before the reboot and uncordons them after so like it uh, makes it a safe reboot instead of just <laughs> pulling the plug and uh, restarting the node and, and maybe losing some data or, or your applications going down time uh, uh, down so that was a good tool that's available and now part of the cncf ecosystem awesome yeah uh, and then the second uh, link I, I found it really helpful and very relevant to the topic today. Uh, uh, top 15 Cube CTL plugins for security engineers. Again, nice. they are good tools. I won't list all 15, but a few that caught my eyes were like Stern. So Stern basically is a plugin that will help you do tail dash F. So if you if you oh, do right. a Cube CT, yeah, if you do a Cube CTL Stern app name, it basically like gives you the logs of 
that app or which basically matches the name of your pod. So that's a cool tool. Uh, policy advisor it suggests you pod security policies and opa policies uh, for your kubernetes cluster so once you run that it will identify things where you need to have policies in place and nice. help you apply those uh, cube login uh, i didn't know this was a need but this looks cool it allows you to uh, allow you to authenticate again for your cli sessions using your oidc provider so like if you have an oidc provider from cli you don't really have that integration so if you install this plugin and if you run it for the first time, it will open up a browser session where you can log in and then it authenticates your CLI session as well. So that was a cool tool. Yeah. And then a final one that like out of the 15 that I wanted to talk about was KSNF. Uh, it's for capturing and analyzing network traffic. So I know okay. yeah. we have used Wireshark uh, in the past a lot. Oh, yeah. Wow. Uh, for, yep. <laughs> <laughs> so this, I think, gives a similar flavor of tool. Uh, for their Kubernetes cluster. So uh, read through the list. We'll have the link in the show notes. Uh, some some cool uh, looking plugins for kubectl. Wireshark, TCP dump, basically mm-hmm. into kubectl. Love it. Yep. <laughs> and then uh, talking about acquisitions, right? Uh, I'll start with the couple of uh, the ones that I want to talk about and then I'll hand it off to you. Uh, sure. uh, the first one being Mirantis acquired a startup called Shippa. Uh, so Shippa... Uh, used to be in the cloud native delivery and uh, application delivery ecosystem. So now uh, they and they had raised around three point seven five million dollars uh, of seed funding in twenty twenty. And the acquisition amount again wasn't disclosed as at an exact amount, but it is assumed to be in in between ten million and thirty million dollars. So I would say like pretty good return. And yeah. I think uh, from reading a couple of articles, Myrandis is planning on integrating Shippa with its Lens platform to accelerate the cloud native application delivery pipelines and also integrate it with your Myrantis Kubernetes engine service that they have. Mm-hmm. So uh, a good uh, exit for Shippa and some good uh, cool technology for Myrantis to integrate into uh, its own products. The second one that I had for today was uh, a startup, again, uh, not a, a big company, but a, a cloud native startup called Harness acquiring another cloud native startup called Propello. So mm-hmm. this um, the Propello had uh, like was a smaller startup that had raised I think sixteen million dollars across their angel seed and series A round. So it was not a big thing. It, I think the number of employees, if I looked up, was like fifty one or fifty three. So not a big company, but it adds a capability to the Harness software and uh, Harness platform as the eighth module. They they like to call it the Harness Software Engineering Insight module. But it basically helps organizations, one of the customers listed on their website being Broadcom, to uh, make their developers more efficient, right? So obviously, with 2023, the way things are, we obviously want to make sure all of our resources are more productive. So this, I think, basically fits into Harness's ecosystem really well and helps them go or move up from, uh, I think they were a $3.7 billion valuation company uh, to even higher now in the future. But yeah, that's a quick list from me. Yeah, absolutely. One to add to the list, right, mm-hmm. is uh, Cloudify is uh, acquired by Dell. So um, basically, if you're familiar with Cloudify, uh, the, the you know infrastructure as code, uh, automation, those kind of things, it makes a lot of sense for Dell. I mean, I work there. I won't say <laughs> what I know, but, um, you know, what, what Dell's doing and especially yeah. in sort of their Apex and cloud journey uh, for their customers. Uh, I think it's a great uh, acquisition. Um, we'll know more where it surfaces uh, mm-hmm. over time, obviously. And the the amount was um, around 100 million. Yeah. I don't know the exact uh, the number publicly. And uh, yeah, really exciting stuff over there. Another Israeli company, actually, the Dell and EMC. I feel like they do a lot of acquisitions from the, that. Mm-hmm. Part, to be honest. Um, and then uh, the only other one I had here uh, for my news is the uh, Colo uh, um, events were officially announced for KubeCon EU. So if you're not familiar with what the Colo events are, if you're going to KubeCon EU, uh, these are events that typically take place a day or two before mm-hmm. the official KubeCon conference um, and focus more into specific communities, right? Whether it's CICD or security, WASM, Edge, all those things. There's usually a specific day for yep. the, the thing you're interested in. Um, and I highly recommend if you can get there early to attend one of these, the organizers um, often, you know, it's a closer knit type of community. The day is uh, very well spent kind of diving into the different technologies. If you're a technologist or just there to kind of consume and learn, um, definitely go check these out. There's usually more that get added that aren't officially part of the CNCF. Yeah. I mean, companies and vendors add some as well. 
I don't think all those are announced yet, um, but these are from the CNCF. Mm -hmm. Check it out. We'll put the link in the show notes. And usually they have so many day zero events running simultaneously. So like you have to oh, actually pick and choose like, okay, what, what am I most interested in? But I don't want to lose out on the, the other thing. Yeah. But don't worry. Like even if you attend your most interesting thing, everything else gets posted on YouTube. Like I know for the service mesh episode that we did, Ryan, I basically went and like watched 75% of the sessions that were part of the day zero service mesh con event at KubeCon Detroit. So like yeah. content will be available. So they don't have a FOMO around it, but it is really valuable to attend in person if you can. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we were part of DOK Day, mm -hmm. uh, which was a day zero one. And the entire nine hour, 10 hour uh, day was on YouTube. All yeah. in one video. <laughs> uh, so oh, that was an interesting uh, way. But you can always go back and just literally uh, go through and have another day within your day. If you want to. Yep. <laughs> Our guest today is Christoph Hartman, CTO and co-founder of Mondu. He's here to talk about uh, all things uh, Kubernetes and security and security posture management. Uh, so without further ado, let's get him on the show. Well, Christoph, welcome to the show. Welcome to Kubernetes Bytes. I know it's been uh, quite a time coming to get you on the show. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself and uh, let everyone know what you're up to? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Robin, for, for having me at this podcast. Super excited. I'm Chris, uh, co-founder and CTO at Mondo. And uh, my key mission is to make the make the world a little bit more secure and and for giving people the tooling to to essentially make this happen. My my career really started I think it's nearly a decade ago um, at at Deutsche Telekom, which is parent okay. of T-Mobile. And back in the days, we really started in how do we build out cloud infrastructure. Uh, with OpenStack back in the days, like this was mm -hmm, a thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and yeah. it was it really drove drove the old security models over the corner because it really hasn't worked, right? And so yeah. the question was like, how do you secure such a critical infrastructure like telecommunication in a really highly ephemeral world? And it was really, really early. And what we've built, uh, Dominic, uh, the other co-founder at, at Mondu, like we together worked there and we built out a project called DevSecIO. And that was the first server hardening framework built all around Chef, Puppet, and Ansible. Mm -hmm. Back in the days, people still like use those things to secure yeah. <laughs> secure infrastructure. And and it's uh, it's really important to figure out like how can how can security be rolled out automatically. And we mm -hmm. had a huge learning with that. And that learning was that it's not really about like fixing the problem. It's really helping people understand what the problem is in the first place. And then automation plays a key role to do this continuously. But, but it's, it's all about like giving the knowledge to people so that they know what to do and they can make better decisions. And based on that, that experience, Dominic and I started the company called VolcanoSec. And okay. VolcanoSec built, built a very popular open source tool to, Inspec, which was the first mm. policy as code engine um, okay. that that we made really really successful. Chef Software acquired our company, and we made this uh, essentially like the biggest part of Chef that to like get get deals. Like because mm -hmm. like at, like a large enterprises used it. Fortune five hundred. Uh, if you look it up in the internet, like Mitre, the research organization of uh, the U.S. government, used it. Mm -hmm. NSA used it, so it's it's essentially we have seen a lot of compliance requirements yeah. in the world, like used by large corporations, but also governments, and how they actually want to go in this fully automated path, mm -hmm. and that that really led to the point where we really learned quick how to do automation for security. But as uh, as time flies by, um, Dom and I left essentially Chef. Because mm -hmm. it was not missing some of the newer tech like Kubernetes, sure, and we, sure. we we always believed in Kubernetes is a thing, and we should like build a security product around that, and and so yeah, that was essentially the cornerstone for starting Wondo, like really building a security product around automation, around security, but built for platform engineers and security engineers. Okay, yeah. gotcha, and yeah. that's awesome, right? I think. 
helping organizations build these secure environments or like i want to ask my next question improve their security posture is a really yeah. great uh, thing to do for the community right so uh, i know ryan and i did a, a, a kubernetes security 101 podcast it's one of our i think top 3 episodes at this oh, point it, nice. it is <laughs> so uh, and that was just you and me right as we spoke about in that podcast it was a mile wide and just a inch deep maybe so yeah. that's why we are mm-hmm. like okay let's get get let's get uh, chris on the pod and let's start talking about and going into some details around kubernetes security so let's start right chris uh, let's start by talking about what is kubernetes security posture management or kspm for short i know people have been familiar with cspm and cloud security posture management how have things evolved and what does this mean for organizations yeah so first of all like uh, i think we should like talk a little bit about security posture management in general mm-hmm. and then like mm-hmm. deep dive into into kubernetes specifics so security posture management essentially really helps you uh, identifying like what is the risk in your infrastructure and and sure. if you want to break it down it is essentially like two things it's uh what is where are your biggest vulnerabilities so essentially mm-hmm. is everything patched and the other problem is like is everything configured properly so finding misconfigurations so so this is like the the short version of what it is of course <laughs> like there are nuances but i think yeah. this this is security posture management and if we apply this mm-hmm. to kubernetes it, it quickly becomes complicated because in Kubernetes land, um, Kubernetes is a really amazing technology to horizontally scale your infrastructure. And that mm-hmm. naturally involves a lot of different layers of technology that, to make that happen. And if we, if we just look at the most frequently used cloud providers, um, that, uh, and it's like, Amazon has EKS, and it's also like mm-hmm. the most frequently used like Kubernetes environment. The same continues with yeah. then uh, like GKE and 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 AKS, right? And so so now you're not having like a Kubernetes security posture management for the cluster only. You also have it for the cloud. Oh, so yeah. it really starts with the cloud account, then goes to the cluster, and even though in <laughs> Kubernetes, like you luckily don't have to deal with the mass like the, the management node sure, um, yeah, that's true. but but you still the nodes need to be taken care of and and like we see some really good improvements where cloud providers like go to a really container os or aws is using bottle rock hopefully more and more sure, going yeah. forward so to to secure those those nodes and then it comes to cluster misconfigurations mm-hmm. workloads uh, and then but also applications and the challenging thing, like using it in, in clouds, is you, if you use IAM stuff, essentially, yep. you can, if you misconfigure, it can happen that from your pod with a wrong mapped service account, you can break out Kubernetes completely and you have a, oh, wow. too much access to the cloud. So, so that's why it's so important to not just see security posture as an isolated piece, but mm-hmm. really at the all technology layers that you essentially use. And that's that's really key for for like when we talk with with customers and users because we 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 want to explain to them hey there are all those layers you need to understand mm-hmm. them and then you can prioritize the issues issues properly. Yeah, as great as Kubernetes is, right to your point, it does add a whole another level of complexity, right? No one, I don't think we've we've said to someone you know that it adds complexity and they've disagreed with that. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, I could imagine from the security standpoint, you know, that's all, like you said, a whole other layer uh, to on top of, uh, you know, CS. Maybe it should be CKSPM. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. We, uh, we, we call this like uh, XSPM, um, like extensible okay, yeah. security <laughs> posture management for the reason that essentially nowadays you can't really restrict this to any technology anymore. Like in the, yeah. in the couple of, uh, a couple of years ago, it was really like you use a tool for X and a tool for Y. But what we believe in is, is that engineers should use the right technology for the right mm-hmm. job they're trying to do. And that doesn't mean like you reduce it to a few like different tags. Like if serverless is great, like you right. serverless, yeah. is container yeah. great? Sometimes yeah. you still want to have a VM with GPU attached directly. Oh, yeah. So there's always a good reason. And, and I think this is what, what we also need to acknowledge as the industry. Like there's not one right thing. Like there are many. And we, mm-hmm. we need to make sure that the tooling that we use in our ecosystem is essentially supporting users in a way that they can do their job. And it's not limiting them in their technology choice to do, to do the work. 
Yeah, that's security a good point. tools yeah. are traditionally yeah. like doing a really bad job of it. It's like <laughs> we, we need to we need to say this. Like they normally uh, are perceived as the blocking piece of things. Like if you have mm-hmm. platform engineers and you should like we have done many like therapy sessions with them and, and we do, <laughs> that was always the biggest thing. Like security is like blocking me. It's like not helping yeah. me. I can't integrate this in my pipeline. Yep. It's like pain, pain, pain. And I, and I think this is. This is what the whole security industry need to needs to change. Oh yeah, I mean the I, I imagine the amount of times a developer has run into a security thing and said, "Well, how do we disable it so I can get yep. past it?" Right? You know, like 100%. oh, SE Linux is getting in your way, <laughs> disable it. Right? You know, like yeah. I, I know that happens <laughs> quite a bit. Um, and I, you know, to what you said before around automating, you know, uh, security. I know that security has often come up as sort of a tertiary or secondary mm-hmm. thing to functionality. Um, mm-hmm. And fundamentally, I think as an industry, and the more we see all these, you know, uh, you know, cybersecurity issues in the industry or in the world, right? Um, it has to become more prevalent. And it's it starts with, you know, from the get-go, we need to think about yes. this stuff. And the best way to do that is to take it out of people's hands and automate it. So um, I'm all for that. Uh, you know, speaking of which, you know, people in general are, you know, are fallible. They make mistakes. <laughs> they misconfigure 100%. things. Um, mm-hmm. And that's that's fine. We're human. But so I'm curious what types of misconfigurations you come across to uh, maybe in your day to day or with your customers or that, you know, you generally see as a community uh, in, in this uh, industry? Yeah, very, very good question. I, I mean, I, just saying this up front, there are like more nuanced things and I just like highlight the biggest issues here. Um, sure, yeah. Which, which are the biggest problems that we see with, with our users. Uh, in Kubernetes land, definitely biggest problem is like service accounts, like service mm-hmm. accounts mounted into into pods where they shouldn't. Um, they have default permissions. Like if you run workloads that don't need any access to Kubernetes API, like why? Um, so that's that's definitely something that's an easy win, uh, but it's sure. also helping you to prevent prevent accidental like pass through attacks. And, and so it's like simple check, but like still very, very often. Um, privileged containers are still like too often being used. Um, mm-hmm. be, like it's um, sometimes even security tools like force you to do that and like i i recommend you like storage tools do too and we're very familiar yeah, yeah, with that. yeah. storage <laughs> tools too so um so essentially like you should always like try to avoid this as much as possible yep. like to the yep. minimal amount if you do that you need to have double watch at those things uh, because mm-hmm. like there could be a good good reason for it right but like in most cases for most workloads you most likely don't need that and yep. it's really important to understand that because once you have a privileged container, you can, and, and we do demos around this quite often, like you can have a malicious container, like mm-hmm. it could be a standard container just with a vulnerability, you break out of it. You, you can, we, we demonstrate this with a latest patch like EKS. You break uh-huh. out of a container, come to the node and take over the whole node. And um, then also like I take over the whole cloud like the cloud account. So the this is wow. possible with like simple misconfiguration, but the good thing is Kubernetes has the right primitives to essentially secure that. Like it's not that the system is inherently insecure, it's more like mm-hmm. it's wrongly configured and the security features that are built in are just not enabled and that's why yeah. this can ha- this can happen. The the next the next biggest issue is all about like IAM permissions, RBAC, like this is too much permissions is like always a problem. You always want to go with least privilege. It's really hard to do it right. You check the box, right? <laughs> yeah, but it's 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 really hard. Like, let's be real. Yeah. Like, you need to test mm-hmm. your application properly. Yeah. You need to make sure that um, you cover all the use cases. Um, what we what we recommend is like really build build a fully automated application pipeline. Um, like frameworks like Salsa help you with uh, guiding you through that. Um, but essentially, like help you to to not do like click ops instead of like automated like git ops, yeah. and and that that helps you also to uh, to identify those things. You can fix things easier. You can test things easier. So I think there are many benefits in doing the automation. It helps you also mm-hmm. with the uh, authentication authorization issues. So um, I'm assuming since yeah. these are like common misconfigurations, they are also like low hanging fruits. Are there 
easy ways to like identify these in in your uh, infrastructure stack or in your applications and then easy ways to fix this or how do we go about it right no it's like totally easy like in kubernetes like you like you have the security context like this is just just manifest annotations essentially or make sure those annotations are not there right so so that's why i'm saying like it's not that kubernetes inherently is insecure that you should be worried about using kubernetes i think kubernetes mm-hmm. has really really good primitives the problem is um that the primitives are like deactivated or just not properly activated and it's yeah. like this is this is what we call about uh, misconfiguration i don't believe mm-hmm. it's the that the tools itself we use are insecure and we see a lot of like things happen in the industry like gvisor or firecracker like that's this gets more and more secure but yeah. it needs to be enabled it needs to be used yeah. and and that's yeah. the that's the tricky point yeah mm-hmm. yeah I, I imagine um i am and our back you mentioned before have similar problems in the sense that you know a lot of times people will get an i am policy that works but not really understand or realize they're probably having too much permission than they actually need mm-hmm. to get the thing working right so yep. uh, i know i've been guilty of this myself of like you know i check that box i'm thinking about security i've built an im policy and it's and my application's happy but really i just have too much going on i can actually <laughs> dial it back and i think yeah. having the understanding of how do you find out where that sweet spot is mm-hmm. right um, mm-hmm. is a challenge <clears throat> It's it's a challenge and it also depends on the attack vectors. Like if you run your own application to you know what your own application is, you have a better understanding sure. of what you need. But if you run like untrusted, like external yeah. code, um, then like, like a, a, an arbitrary Git pipeline, like sure. give you one sure. example. Yeah. Um, so then you need to make extra care, right? Like you need to make sure that those those um, things that run it have are really protected. Otherwise it's a supply chain attacks all over, but like like mm-hmm. It's really, really easy to mostly protect those things, but it needs to be surfaced. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So I know we spoke about the the managed control plane, right? Offerings. We spoke about EKS, AKS, GKE, where you users don't get access to those control planes. So it's more of a shared security model, as AWS likes to call it, right? Where mm-hmm. you are only responsible for your work nodes and your applications. But even with the shared security models, are there any other things that I can make? Uh, that I can do to protect my cluster overall? Like, how do I make sure that I'm running my applications, assuming the applications mm-hmm. are really well yep. built in a secure mm-hmm. environment? Like, how do, are there, are there like three things or something like that, right? Like an easy formula to make sure uh, uh, my mm-hmm. base cluster is all good to go. Um, so first of all, if you use managed Kubernetes, you need like to secure your cloud account. Like that's like the base mm-hmm. primitive. Like you don't think about this immediately because you think you run like Kubernetes. But it really starts with the cloud account, narrowing it down, narrowing IAM permissions, make sure like this, and preferably run like one cloud account per cluster if you can, if it mm-hmm. makes sense just to isolate them properly. Um, the the two-factor authentication, like all the stuff that applies, like it's it's really the basics that come in. Like um, Permissions, permissions, permissions is definitely the biggest one. And then on Kubernetes level, I think it doesn't really matter like if you use it on-prem or in the cloud. The mm-hmm. master node is mostly protected, but like the nodes you still need to check and the um, workload protection needs to be enabled as well. So so I, coming back to misconfigurations we just talked about, and like simple yeah. uh, manifests. Um, I think it's, it's just to understand those layers, cloud account, then Kubernetes, and then application workloads. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Absolutely. So, you know, I think let's shift towards um, the application a little bit more. You know, I know Bhavan and I, you know, covered a little bit of workload security last time we we talked about this, and we talked about things like image scanning and patching, and um, but we'd love to hear your opinions on sort of best practices in terms of you know, the actual workload that's running inside Kubernetes as mm-hmm. well. And and I know I've seen some predictions and read some articles around like the year of the S-bomb and Kubernetes <laughs> and things like that. So um, yeah, I'd love to get your take on that. <clears throat> yeah, I think um, I'm not, not necessarily a fan of like those like fancy keywords. I really always try to talk with, with users about like, okay, like what's the biggest problem first? And then let's mm-hmm. see how we solve it technically. Um, from yep. my perspective, when we talk about like, Kubernetes security, we can generally split this in like management plane, like where we have the cluster and 
the cloud account, which is one way of securing. And now we're focusing on the part that continuously deploy into Kubernetes via hopefully pipelines. Um, and and the, the first step to essentially to secure your things is to know what you are running. So mm -hmm. like it, it sounds strange, but like essentially <laughs> it, it's, it's just knowing is half of the, the way. Um, yeah. So you, you essentially need to know what kind of workloads you're running, how, what kind of containers are you running? Are you running self-built containers? Are you running external containers? Uh, how many vulnerabilities have my running things? How many misconfigurations do I have in my Kubernetes manifest? Like understanding this um, mm -hmm. makes, makes, makes you much better because then you can prioritize, you can hand off work, you can teach and train people so that um, that helps you much. And the next level is then really using mostly industry best practice um, guidelines, um, CI, okay. CIS or NSA. Um, they <laughs> offer really good guidelines. Uh, they're sometimes overreaching. So it's still like it <laughs> needs to be, um, needs to be um, considered like based on your requirement because um, like a bank obviously have different uh, standards sure. than a startup, right? So, so understanding that like there's not like one way, but those levels normally go with, this is the one thing that like, you have to do. Yeah. And I think it's like a little bit more nuanced, like they come yeah. with good guidances and then like talk with, talk, talk all those things through and tools, tools help you to guide you through the way. Um, gotcha. so I think my, my next question is around, as, as you said, right? Like you always have to make sure that whatever you're running is from a, a trusted source is mm -hmm. from uh, the, the container image, for example, is properly signed. And I know the word provenance has gotten a lot of uh, discussion. Like it, it has been the topic of discussion recently. Uh, and that's how we ended up with the software bill of materials or SBOMs. But the new thing that I think I wanted to get your take on was SBOM attestation. Like why is that required? I know we have the VEX standard, like how do all of those things fit in, right? Like if I'm uh, a company that's producing an application or, or pushing an application to production or a vendor that's uh, pr producing a product, how do I make sure that my users trust it, right? How, how does that attestation process work? Yeah. Um, first of all, we need to understand the different attack vectors. So we have attack vectors in our software when we build software, like this is normally like use like software dependency checks and you mm -hmm. use like different tools to check vulnerabilities. Then you have mm -hmm. the pipeline and you can like make supply chain attacks. And then hopefully the software that you have defined in your Git like is being built in the pipeline. And then like we have the software in our deployed in our runtime and then like mm -hmm. things happen there as well. Um, so, so when we think about Again, it's all about like vulnerabilities on software level, but also like package level. So yeah. runtime and build time. And then the, the next level is like, how do you make sure that the stuff you're running is actually the stuff you, you've been built from, right? So, yeah. so that's, that's the, the biggest problem. So if you use tools like Cosign, for example, are really good like for image signing. Um, they, they don't solve your vulnerability problem. They don't solve your misconfiguration problem. What they do though, is they say like, hey, Ryan, like you've built this container. Like, why is this container wrong? So I can go to Ryan and say like, hey, Ryan, yeah. like something is off. Why is it off? Right. And we can discuss it. So it's not right. like it prevents men in the middle attacks. And you can, first of all, only prove that this is the thing like you've built there. So there are still like proof issues here because like you essentially mm -hmm. just sign the container, but like all the stuff that went into the container, like this, there's, there's still part, that's why Salsa framework is important to, to make the whole chain like provable. Um, okay. But attestation helps you. It helps you in preventing man in the middle attack, but you need to understand it's not preventing vulnerability attacks. It's not preventing misconfiguration attacks. It's just like proof of work, like who has done it. And, and basically uh, it's on the user, right? Do I trust Ryan? Like, do, can I use his image? And <laughs> Ryan is shaking his head. So, okay, we can't trust Ryan. But we can trust this. <laughs> no, okay. Okay, so that makes sense. And uh, Chris, you used the term salsa a lot, right? I know that stands for supply chain levels of software artifacts. I know because yeah. it's written down in my notes. Like, what's that framework? Like, that's a, that's a new thing, right? That, uh, that we have been hearing in the community. And how does it help improve the security posture? Yeah, hundred percent. So, so let's assume like we have our Node.js app, and then have, we have a fully patched thing, like all the JavaScript 
dependencies are 100% patched. Everything is green. So mm -hmm. that means we are really good in our security level and we want to rethink, like whenever we deploy it into production, everything is green, right? The problem though is, what happens if the build pipeline is being attacked? So, and you essentially, during the build process, the attacker injects a new vulnerability or a new source mm -hmm. code dependency. And the, this, is, this is the key problem. So if you have manual work, like you can't prove that the thing that you essentially have in your Git is really like used to being built. And so that's why, that's why you want to have a framework like Salsa that guides you through that process and first like make sure you have a fully automated pipeline step one, right? Like so yeah. go from nothing automated, like people like developers just, oh, deploy this container from my workstation, boom, done. Prod. Like we have done this many times, uh, not not at Mondo, <laughs> but like uh, I think we as like engineers, we have probably done it quite quite often in the past mm -hmm. just to get our work done. But this is not a good approach. This this is not good for for companies who want to build up trust. Instead, mm -hmm. like you really want to have uh, use use Git pipelines to have everything automated. The whole build process is automated, and then in each step, you make sure that really the dependencies that you have in Git is being used. Uh, and so that helps you to essentially say, okay, this, this binary is being built from this source right. code. And then mm -hmm. you can guarantee, okay, like the green, the green Git is actually also the green binary, right? Um, right. Okay. Right. Or package. So, and that's, that's why this framework is so important. It has source code integ integrity, but also built integrity. And that means the stuff that you're building and releasing out to people is the stuff that you're saying is in Git. And that's, that's the important part. Because otherwise, you have a disconnect between the green state in your Git and the, the packages you provide. Yeah, I like the connection here with Git. Because um, I, I know, Bob, and we've done a few episodes around concepts around GitOps, right? Yep. And, it, and it always comes up that you know, GitOps helps an overall security posture. Um, and so connecting it to this, I think, uh, and, and, it's, and it's clear on why um, those types of models and sort of pipelines help your security posture. Um, I like that connection. And uh, um, I don't know, what would you say? Uh, is our trend towards things like GitOps helping your day-to-day, -day, I guess, with customers as well? <clears throat> um, we, we use, we use and like everything at Mondo is like fully automated build uh, mm -hmm. because, because um, like it, it also makes reliable build process. You normally like have advantages like faster build processes. Um, and it also, it, it doesn't solve the vulnerability part sure. per se, um, but you have everything tracked in Git. So even if you have an attacker later on, like you can always prove, hey, this attacker like manipulated Git here and then mm -hmm. it's in the Git history. So, so it's also coming back to proof of things what happened, right? So you can always uh, have that. And then you, like the next level is you enforce essentially like peer review for approvals, like nobody can like push directly there. The mechanisms you can then in, improve on the source code level to, to make this more, more difficult. And it's all about making things more difficult. Can you prevent all, all the different attacks? Probably not, but you can make it, you can make it so that it's a, a lot of work and, and mm -hmm. attackers always take the, the easiest way to get in. So think about a house, you have a fully secured house, like all the like fancy, like new alarm stuff, and then mm -hmm. you leave the door open, right? So like, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't help you. Um, so, so that's, that's and attackers, like they don't like switch off their alarm if, if your door is open. So, so yep. that's why it's so important to build essentially this um, secure, understanding the security posture, know where you are, like on which level in pipeline, and in production, and and that really helps you to to know where where you need to navigate and where to need to like fix stuff first. Yeah, so that makes total sense, right? Like I think I was thinking about the same the uh, home, a good one, yeah. yeah, home uh, analogy that you used. Another thing is like if if a lion has to feed, like it has just to conquer the slowest hyena, right? Like you you don't yeah. want to make sure you have to make sure that your organization is not that slowest hyena, like you're not the most vulnerable. Because as you said, attackers will go for the, the slowest or the weakest target there. Yeah, I, I, I like the, there was one that came up in my head about, um, you know, the GPUs and iPads that have been coming up, like filled with cement, like the man in the middle attacks. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, it's, for some reason that came up in my head as well. Anyway, great analogies. Um, but I think something you said that was key there is, you know, make it more difficult for the attacker. But at the same time, you're also trying to make it less difficult for a developer to 
use it, mm-hmm. you know, right? So because right. if you make it yes. more difficult, the more difficult for a developer, they're not going to use it. Mm-hmm. So I think that's yep. a, a challenge as well. And maybe something you're tackling already. <laughs> Okay. And then I think uh, while doing some research for this episode, right, and uh, I came up across a tool that you guys maintain called CNSpec and how that's available as an open source tool for organizations to consume. Can we talk about how what CNSpec is built for? Like what what challenges does it solve for? And then how can people use it? Yeah. Um, so CNSpec is our take on how to quickly assess your security posture. Um, mm-hmm. It's It's one of the... Like it essentially helps you to continuously monitor like and misconfiguration across all the clouds. Uh, it helps you to scan VMs, containers, Kubernetes workloads. Uh, it helps you to identify uh, identity misconfigurations, and it's also mm-hmm. built for shift left. And the the way like to think about this is like it's extensible on multiple ways. Like we have providers, we have that allows us to do AWS, GCP. We have okay. Uh, GitHub integration, we have operating system, container, and remote. Um, so, so different le- providers, similar to how Terraform mm-hmm. works. It's really yep. the same thing. Like it works. It's think about like Terraform for security. And then the the we have we have a resource packs um, that allows us to write like resources on top of those providers, and then uh, can build you can build policies on top. And this is like a highly customizable like. Framework we call it like it's the only extensible security framework. Like where you can like um, you're not stuck into a specific technology, and that was really important for us. Like when we started um, Mondo, we wanted to build something that is holistically for users, like where they mm-hmm. can essentially focus on the problem. And the problem is like where is my biggest risk? My problem is not how does Docker work or how does container yeah. work or how does the container registry work. I just want to know, like, where's my risk, right? And so mm-hmm. um, abstracting that problem is actually hard. Like, a lot of people, mm-hmm. like, always told us, hey, guys, like, this is not going to work. Like, you can't <laughs> do that. Um, and and they're, they, they, we've proved them wrong because, like, yeah, obviously One of the best motivators right there, right? Yes, <laughs> yes. And, and I think he, like, um, we did abstra- giving giving users to say something like scan uh, SSH, scan container image, scan AWS, and essentially runs policies with checks that are totally dynamic. All the checks that we ship, uh, and we have open source policies available, and we have CS policies available, we have NSA policies available, so you can just like out of the box use those policies, run them, and see quickly where your security posture is. And, and it's really an open framework, like similar to Terraform. But mm-hmm. for security, so it's really extensible. We encourage people to like contribute, tell us what's missing, because we really want to help users to solve the problem of hey, where's my security posture? No matter like what kind of tech they're using, we have customers yeah. asking for AIX support, <laughs> uh, and we have customers <laughs> asking like yeah. going going in the different direction where they all use like it for for IAM permissions, S3 buckets, and so on, yeah. and that's all working. And so that mm-hmm. makes it like super easy for for teams to first start with an out of the box policy, but then also go off and say, "Look, it's in my environment. There are specific requirements, so I want to customize it." And that's why they can write their own policies and override things. And that's that's the key. Like this is why it's also open source because we believe this should be like a um, your own right to secure mm-hmm. yourself. Like we want to make this available. Um, to everyone, and that's that's why we really open sourced it um, to to make make it available to everyone. And I, I really like the breadth, right? Like it can scan everything from like a VMware host to a VMware virtual machine to like your Terraform uh, plans mm-hmm. to Kubernetes clusters to Docker registry. Like regardless of where you are on that modernization journey, like this can help that's... you scan everything. <laughs> Yeah, that's and it includes vulnerabilities and misconfiguration. And, and what mm-hmm. you said is really important. It's um, we believe organizations are not just in one tech. Like organizations mm-hmm. are always transforming, and so they have something in VMware, and they have something in cloud, and they have yep. something in containers, and something bare metal. And I think the 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 it's it's back to my original story. It's really not mm-hmm. about like telling people this is all right or this is wrong. They normally know why they're doing it. And mm-hmm. so we, we don't want to like judge it. We just say, look, we look at this, we help you get uh, what's the risk there, and then you can make your decisions. Um, so it's really built for humans 
to make better decisions. Yeah, and you, you mentioned earlier the idea of sort of mixed workloads, and I, I really think we're seeing a trend towards that anyway, and I, I see that as sort of a foreseeable future, right? These mixed VM, container, serverless workloads, and, and picking the right tool for the job is also very mm -hmm. much embedded in that thought process. So having security tools that also work like this, um, and I could see, you know, we're already seeing orchestration tools that kind of get into this, right? Let me do both. Let me do all three of those. So I think very important yep. and a good lead in, uh, I think, to our final question here is like, how do people get involved? Obviously, they can go and check out this project um, and see if it works for them and contribute. But is there other resources that you'd love to share? And or you mentioned a, a cool EKS demo where you broke out and controlled the cloud. Do you have that available? I know I'm interested in <laughs> yeah. that, but anything you have, that'd be great. Yeah, we can definitely share this. Uh, I can send it to you so you can like add this to, to, yep. to the podcast. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we are always like first, we want to like get user, more user feedback. Essentially, we want, if we want to have a really like useful tool um, available. Um, so like we have open source uh, policies, we have open source resources. So I think the easiest one is to look at the policies, make sure um, like we, we do it double checking and triple checking for those things, but sometimes you mm -hmm. miss things. So um, like it's easy to contribute. If you have an application where you say this is not covered, um, you can contribute this uh, to this shared policies, make this available to the community. Because we, we believe that building up this community around the security content yeah. is just helpful for the community itself, right? Um, of course. We want to help people to be secure, and that means like the content needs to be available. It needs to be easy to share those content. Um, and it starts on 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 the the queries, the checks, the policies, but then also goes down to more integrations. Um, so let even if you're not a, a go coder, like like feel free mm -hmm. to just suggest like features. Um, it's always mm -hmm. helpful to see that. So I think um, that's always like what we can ask for. Like really try try use it. Give us feedback. We are really. Uh, nice humans, so you can go to our <laughs> Git, GitHub discussions, like start start a discussion if you're unsure. Um, and and yeah, we are definitely looking forward to this. Yeah, you being good humans definitely is something that we can attest, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I mean, it's super exciting to <laughs> with, you, with you too. Well, great, uh, Chris. It was uh, really a pleasure to have you on the show. And um, uh, I know I learned a lot. So um, mm -hmm. hopefully everyone else listening did as well. And we'll love to have you back one day. Uh, thank you, Bobin. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you so much. It was an, super exciting. All right, Bobin. Well, I think that conversation was great. I think I feel like I say that every time with our guests. I probably do. But um, yeah. I, you know, especially in security space, I always feel like I'm learning a lot. And Christoph mm -hmm. was just probably full of even more information that we could spend hours and hours more with him. But, you know, if you had any takeaways from that conversation, what, what would you take away from it? Yeah, like I, I really liked the, uh, the succinct way in which he described the Kubernetes security posture management, like the bite size, right? Like make sure you don't have any configuration, like misconfigurations, and then make sure you, you are keeping all your components patched. That's an awesome description. Like if yeah. you just want to, a, key uh, a quick reminder of what security posture management is, this, this makes sense. Uh, but in addition to that, right? Uh, trying to understand what some of these terms mean. Like I know in the ecosystem, right? If you're not working with security on a day-to-day -day basis, some of these terms can feel a lot overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Like things like S-bombs. I know S-bomb has been around for like 15 months at this point, but keeping up with S-bomb and how the standard is evolving, what is S-bomb attestation? What's the VEX standard? Uh, how does image signing work? All of these things are, are getting pretty important, right? Like it's not enough to just have a list of all your different application components in an s -bomb. It's actually like, it, if for me to trust that the application that you are giving me is secure, I want you to make sure like that you sign it uh, or you attest to it. So that's a good standard and the way it's evolving. And then just for this episode, right? Like when I was doing some research, I came across the Salsa framework and like, okay, what is it? Like it, it has a cool name, but then how is it helping organizations? So uh, I know uh, Chris broke it down into uh, what it does for organizations, but there are different levels, right? Level zero means you're not doing anything, but then there are levels one through four. And it basically gives you a standard baseline. So I know Chris mentioned that uh, healthcare companies or finance companies don't have to be at the same security level as startups or startups don't have to be at the same level. 
but having these different levels gives the community gives the uh, gives yeah. different organizations a level to standardize to like okay i'm i'm salsa standard uh, level 2 certified or things like that so uh, having these in, in place and then having somebody like chris actually interpret them for us was really helpful for me yeah absolutely I, honestly it made me want to go get some pico de gallo uh, <laughs> and, and made my mouth water but uh, uh but technology wise yeah, yeah absolutely uh was very enlightening and i like the fact that you know chris said he doesn't love those big terms right yeah and it's and it's more the way he kind of goes about working with customers is like let's identify where you're at and then go from there to make you know to to improve and make it more difficult mm-hmm. for any you know the bad actors to get in there i like that very Sort of i like that approach of sort of practicality rather yep. than just like uh you know cio objective using big terms and saying we have to do this right mm-hmm. and even if that's the case it's well let's let's fit the level for for your application um i for me the takeaway that i think it most rang true was the fact that kubernetes and these uh cloud sort of accounts that we're using mm-hmm. every day um they have the right print of primitives right? yeah right um we're not using them correctly <laughs> or i shouldn't say i shouldn't generalize to all of but mm-hmm. a, a lot of what he's seeing is misconfigurations and yeah. so uh the concept around automation to you know, take people's hands quite literally out of uh the pipeline and uh, have it automated and doing it in a way that's using it correctly right um just because our back is there i am is there those tools are are hard to get perfectly right for your application i mean mm-hmm. you know i remember being asked and still are asked like What's the right IAM policy for this specific application? Well, it takes some time to figure that out, yep. right? Um, and so I, I just want to, you know, as my takeaway, I think it's very important to just reevaluate what you have. What tools do you already have that maybe you're not using? Or maybe you could double check, um, you know, how your company mm-hmm. is kind of enabling it. Is it enabled, right? I know Chris said that at one point is they're turned off, right? So, yeah. Um, I think that is as well. So. Uh, you know, I think all worth uh, diving into and, and there's a lot of concepts in security. So, um, you know, there's there's a ton more we could talk about here. And I wanted to call out if anybody is working on a specific problem around security or improving your security posture or using some of these things that we talked about today, come talk to us. We'd yep. love to have you on the show. I think security is um, as, as something we as an industry have to take a lot more seriously. I think the cloud native community is seeing that uh, cloud community in general. Uh, is seeing that and so all for doing some more uh, interviews and content on this space so um with that i know there's a couple things we wanted to do before we sign off today one is um we wanted to shout out to amir uh, dixit i hope i'm saying that correctly but he (laughs) sent over a really kind uh, appreciation email Mm -hmm. um uh and just thanking us for some of the uh content we did on i think it was GitOps. Was it service mesh service mesh sorry yeah. and he gave a really good example of you know how he was working in the space that he is and and uh, a very specific sort of idea of how it's enabled him to a- adapt and and take on mtls and the, some of the things we talked about in the show so mm-hmm. we really appreciate getting those messages and emails and uh and amir thank you um uh if you want some stickers send us your information yeah. we will send you out some some kubernetes bite stickers and uh, uh, hopefully you can enjoy those. So I think that was really uh, the end of today. So without further ado, that brings us to the end of today's episode. I'm Ryan. I'm Robin. And thanks for joining another episode of Kubernetes Bite. Thank you for listening to the Kubernetes Bytes podcast.